Would you please be Remain standing. <laughs> I knew I was supposed to say something. <laughs> I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the 11th chapter of Mark. We're going to begin reading there at the 22nd verse. Hear now what God is saying to us this morning. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please be seated? Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you would come close right now. That you would draw close to your people so that, that we could hear your voice. So that we could recognize your voice. For, for we open our Bibles to receive your word, your living word. Not just words on a page, but that word that penetrates our hearts and brings transformation. So I ask, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross and that Jesus Christ and he alone would be lifted up here. For where Jesus is lifted up, there's new life for us all. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we continue this sermon series where we are inviting you to unload your baggage. That we have these, these habits of, of carrying around unnecessary weight upon our shoulders that, that the Lord invites us to leave behind. Now when it comes to this morning's sermon, I want to tell you right up front, I really don't want to preach it. I don't want to preach it because when, when I preach it, I've got to listen to it. <laughs> And when you start talking about unforgiveness and, and forgiveness, nobody wants to hear that. I mean, it's too painful. It is painful. But it's a necessary pain. This, this whole idea of forgiveness I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who finds it hard in fact it is it is such a struggle that we have to be commanded to do it Paul when he writes to the Colossians in the third chapter this is what he says bear with one another and if anyone has a complaint against another forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. It's hard to forgive. It, it has to be commanded. And, and let me give you a little insight right here. It's not natural. It's only supernatural. So when we talk about, about forgiveness, we're not going to feel like forgiving. And yet it's commanded, and if it's commanded, it is possible. And it's, well, says it's necessary. Now, here's the thing. If we are unforgiving towards those who need our forgiveness, then we're guilty of the sin of unforgiveness, and we need forgiveness to forgive in the first place. That's how necessary, necessary it is. Now, why are we so unforgiving? Well, the obvious place to start is the fact that, that we have our anger that comes with it. Because when someone does something to us, we resented it. 
It frustrates us. It annoys us. It, it hurts us. So we become angry. The second reason that we're, we're unforgiving is it, it, un, it offends our, our sense of justice. I mean, we, we feel like people need to be held accountable for their actions, and forgiveness sounds way too close but to letting them off the hook. We're also unforgiving because of our pride. As long as we can hold a sin over somebody else, we get to feel morally superior to them. We get to feel like that Pharisee who stood at the altar and pointed over and said, God, I'm thankful I'm not like that sinner over there. Still another reason that we're unforgiving is because it's, it's so convenient. Because as, as long as, as we see that sin, <laughs> we get to have an excuse. We get to have an excuse for, for the way we're acting, for the way we're feeling. We can say, don't look at me. It's their fault. This forgiveness thing, it's, it's hard because of the very nature of what forgiveness is. Because forgiveness is, is me allowing the offender to be released from the offense. It means that, that I am surrendering my right to revenge. It means that I can no longer ever pick that sin back up and use it against them. I, I don't get to say, do you remember when you, or you always. Now forgiveness doesn't make any room for that. When we're forgiving, we are saying that our relationship Yours and my relationship is worth more than the sin. That the love that we share is greater than the, the sin that gets in our way. And there is no relationship that we have that doesn't require a lot of forgiveness. In fact, that's actually one of the things that, that brings us together. It's one of the things that we hold in common Every last one of us is in need of forgiveness. And a whole lot of it. Do you remember the time that, that Peter came to Jesus one day? He thought he would sound magnanimous. And, and so he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, how often should I forgive someone? Maybe seven times? That's such a perfect number. That sounds impressive. Seven times, right, Jesus? Jesus says, not even close. Not seven times, Peter, but 77 times. Whoa. Who could keep up with that count? Exactly. This whole issue of, of forgiveness, it, it's going to be this continuing struggle that, that we have. And, and that's why we have to talk about it so often. Now, don't ever think that when we talk about forgiving someone, we're ignoring the sin. It's actually the very opposite. Because when, when we are, are forgiving somebody, we're having to, to face the sin head on. We're having to acknowledge it. We're actually having to, to deal with it. In fact, it is the only way that we can, can truly deal with the sin and stop all of its toxic after effects. See, what happens when, when, we, when we have an offense against each other, when we do wrong to each other, the way sin works is it's divisive and it's destructive. Sin separates us. And unforgiveness maintains that gap. And unforgiveness allows that sin that's thrown at us to enter into us so that it begins to grow. You see, sin is a communicable disease. 
And without unforgiveness, it gets into us and it becomes a part of us. And it starts to eat away at us just like it eats away at that person who's done wrong to us. It's only forgiveness that is able to, to cleanse that sin out of us. To, to let us let go of that sin and to be done with it and, and to stop it in its tracks. Today, today we're reminded of the kind of healing and power that forgiveness gives. This is St. Patrick's Day. A lot of you remembered and wore your green today. I don't know how familiar you are with the story of St. Patrick. He lived somewhere in the, the 4th and 5th centuries in what was then Roman-occupied Britain. When he was a teenager, he was kidnapped. And he was sold into slavery in Ireland. In Ireland, he was made to be a shepherd. And it was while he was out in the, the fields that he rediscovered his faith. And it was that faith that he relied on in order to survive. Well, after six years in captivity, he finally was able to escape. And he made his way back home. But no sooner had the homecoming celebration ended than God came calling. God came calling Patrick to go back to Ireland and to share the good news. It was crazy of God to choose Patrick. He, he had just made it through all of these miraculous hardships to get back home. And immediately he turns around and he's being sent to Ireland. And he's supposed to tell them about Jesus. Well, the only way that was going to happen was if he was able to forgive both his kidnapper, kidnappers and his, his captors. Well, he did. And the reason we celebrate St. Patrick's Day is because when he forgave those people, it unleashed the power of God across the land and it transformed all of the island of Ireland. This forgiveness stuff, it's painful, but it's powerful. That's why we turn to the 11th chapter of Mark today. Now, you have to understand the full context of that chapter. Go back to the beginning of the chapter and you find Jesus entering into Jerusalem on that last journey to the cross. He has the triumphant entry and then he and the disciples, they go to the temple, they look around and, and then it says in Mark that they, they left and they went to the village of Bethany. Bethany was a small village on the, the southeastern slope of the Mount of Olives, which meant that they had to leave Jerusalem, go down through the Kidron Valley, and then go about two miles total. Why would he go into Jerusalem, then turn around and leave Jerusalem? Well, remember, this is Passover. Passover meant that, that the city was filled with pilgrims who had gathered there. Well, to find lodging, it would make sense for them to go to Bethany, where they had friends where they could find the lodging they needed. The next morning, they headed back to Jerusalem. As they were going along, Jesus saw a fig tree. Its leaves were out, but when he got there, he saw that there wasn't any fruit on it. Now, to be fair, it wasn't the season for fruit, but nevertheless, Jesus cursed the tree and said, no one will ever eat your fruit. And they went on their way. Which I always imagine the disciples who were going along, they hear Jesus curse a, a fig tree and they just kind of look at each other and say, well, that was weird. And they keep track. Well, they, they, that evening, come back to Bethany. The next day, they head back to Jerusalem. Except this time, when they, they go by that fig tree, they see that it has completely shriveled down to its roots. And Peter points it out. He says, 
Rabbi, look, isn't that crazy? You cursed that tree and it, it withered away. That became a teaching moment for Jesus. Because when, when they saw that and when Peter said that, Jesus said very simply, have faith in God. Now remember, before Jesus was born, the angel Gabriel had gone to visit Mary. And Gabriel had explained to Mary that with God, nothing is impossible. So when Jesus has faith, what he's saying is that, that when we trust in God, when we believe in God, the unbelievable becomes possible. When, when, we, when we have faith in God, when we spend time in prayer with God, when we, when we are in in relationship with God that means that we are plugged into that infinite impossible working power of his that we're joining in in his work and and getting ourselves caught up in in his desires for our world so here's Jesus teaching teaching his followers that we have faith in this God who has proven always to, to be faithful to us, to always want the best for us. So he continues there in that 23rd verse. He says, Whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and doesn't waver but believes that what is said will really happen, it'll happen. That verse has always been kind of strange to me never made a lot of sense until, until you realize that when Jesus said those words, he was standing there on the Mount of Olives. Now, if you go down the eastern slope of, of the Mount of Olives, go far enough, you're going to be wading into the Dead Sea. And when Jesus says that, that if you say to this mountain to go throw yourself into the sea, that's the, the image that he would have evoked right there, the, the land flattening out while Jerusalem remains high and lifted up. Jesus may have had in mind there the prophecies of Zechariah. If you go to the 14th chapter of Zechariah, there it describes the day of the Lord and says that, that His feet will be on the Mount of Olives and it will split in two. And that will be a sign of God's reign over all of the earth. So when Jesus teaches that, what, what He's saying there is that, that when we align our hearts with God's will, then heaven and earth start to become one. It's this incredible work of God that, that is happening in us. And then he, he says in the 24th verse that when we put our trust in God's hands through prayer, these great things happen, these God-sized things happen, because he says we pray to God, we trust in God, and we receive what God has for us. And then that brings us to this amazing 25th verse. That annoying verse that says that prayer is so powerful, we have the power to forgive sins. You know, forgiving, it sometimes feels like moving a mountain. But what Jesus says is that that's exactly the power we have. The power to, to forgive sins. And in fact, what Jesus goes on to say is that, that when we are one of His, when we are with Jesus, when Jesus is with us, with us when, when Jesus is in us, then forgiveness is just what we do. Forgiveness is one of the identifying characteristics of the followers of Jesus. It's so much part of us, He says. That our being forgiven by God and our forgiving of others 
It's intertwined together. It's, it's knit together. See, forgiveness is the weapon of choice in the kingdom of God because it absolutely, completely disarms our enemies. Yeah, it's, it's painful. It is sacrificial to forgive. But if we forgive our enemies, they've got nothing to use against us. See, if, if we give up our, our desire to get even, if we quit trying to poke out an eye for an eye, if we lay down our lives, then there is nothing our enemies can, can do to us. So why do we forgive? Because it sets us free, free to love. In forgiveness, we're no longer handcuffed to that sin because we have completely been released from it. Why do we forgive? We forgive to regain power. Because we are refusing to be controlled by that sin. It doesn't have a grasp on us at all. Why do we forgive? We forgive because every time we forgive, we become a little more like Jesus. We allow him to, to grow in us and, and we become that more glorious reflection of who he is. Now, if forgiveness is so powerful. How do we actually do it? I'll tell you how we begin. We begin by focusing on the cross. Because it is on the cross that our sins have been forgiven. It's at the cross that we realize that, that God has held nothing back from us so that, that we can be made whole. You see, we're only going to forgive in proportion to how much we've been forgiven. And it's only in that understanding that we'll begin to pour out mercy to, to those around us. See, when forgiveness is given to us, forgiveness is forgiving to others. Second thing we do, and this is really hard, <laughs> begin to pray for that person. Pray that God would bless them. I've had to learn this lesson the hard way. And I, it's become a, a discipline when, when somebody wrongs me. When someone hurts, whether it was intentional or unintentional, I have to pray for them day by day. And it may take a long time. I, sometimes I will confess it's taken me years to get to that place where I actually do want God's best for them and I can forgive them. So pray. Third thing is that you have to be honest with yourself. And by that I mean you've got to bring that, that sin and all its hurts that have been inflicted on you, all those pains to the surface where you're willing to face them. You've got to get real about it before you can, can deal with it. And once you've gotten honest with yourself about it, then get honest with that person. That person who's, who's hurt you. You have to go to them. Tell them. Focus on, on their behavior and on your pain. And if it's somebody who's no longer living, still do it. <laughs> Whether it's writing a letter or, or visiting a cemetery, whatever it takes, get it out there. Now I want you to be clear about this right here. If somebody has done to you something criminal, they need to be turned over to authorities. Not for revenge. The reason you do it is as an act of love. You turn them over to authorities because you are showing your love for others and you don't want them to be hurt by this same individual. But you've got to bring those, those hurts out. And the final piece that I've discovered is that you have to keep praying to keep them forgiven. And by that I mean choose not to hate. 
choose instead to, to always to, to love. Now, they may not want you to forgive them. You can't control that. But you forgive them anyway. Because they can't stop you. And that'll show them. But you let go of that sin and you begin to live the abundant life that God has for you. Because when you go through this, this painful, powerful process, you never know how it's going to change this world forever. In Egypt, Amir Adib is the most prominent talk show host in that country. A few years ago, live on the air, he sat silently staring for 12 seconds, which in, in television, 12 seconds of silence is, is an awkward eternity. But, but he was trying to find the right words to use. And, and finally, he said, Egypt's Christians are made of steel. See, Adib had just been watching one of his colleagues who was in a simple home in Alexandria. She was there interviewing the, the widow of Nassim Fahim. Fahim had been the security guard at St. Mark's Cathedral. Palm Sunday, 2017. A bomber had showed up at that church. Fahim, as the security guard, directed the individual to a metal detector. It was at that point that the terrorists detonated. Fahim was the very first one to die there. But it was because he was there, it was because... He was doing his job that there were dozens of lives that were spared inside the cathedral that day. Well, here, here on national TV was his widow with her children by her side being interviewed. I want you to hear what she said. I'm not angry at the one who did this. I'm telling him, may God forgive you and we also forgive you. Believe me, we forgive you. And then she added, you put my husband in a place I couldn't have dreamed of. Now it was the words of that widow that left Adib dumbfounded. And he began to, to stammer about how the, the Coptic Christians there in Egypt had, had suffered atrocities for hundreds of years. And he couldn't get past the scandal of, of this moment. This outrageous grace of Jesus that's found in his followers. And so his voice cracked and he said, how great is this amount of forgiveness you have? If your enemy knew how much forgiveness you have, he would not believe it. If it were my father, I could never say this. These people have so much forgiveness. This is their faith and religious conviction. These people are made of a different substance. That's what I want to hear. We're made of a different substance. And you know what's going to happen if, if we followers of Jesus go around forgiving people? <laughs> All hell is going to break loose. Because that's our job. Jesus says to his disciples that the gates of hell will not prevail against you. <laughs> and forgiveness is just that powerful. You know, I'm glad I preached this sermon after all. I needed to hear it. Hope you did too. Let's pray. 
Well, God, forgiveness, it's, it's painful, but it's powerful. It's painful like, like a cross, like, like nails being driven, and, and yet it is so good. Bringing deliverance, bringing healing, bringing wholeness. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that, that we would be transformed and, and that we would be made more like Jesus and, and more willing to forgive. And as we forgive like Jesus, it becomes even easier for us to forgive. No less painful, but, but our willingness is, is there. So Lord, do a work in your church. Bring a change in us so that we can offer this healing, we can offer reconciliation with all the world. And it's only in Jesus' name that we can. And it's only in his name that we pray. Amen.